Um, so thank you very much for inviting me and thank you very much for having me. It's been great. Uh, I, norm I don't have any PowerPoint presentation to show you. Um, I normally do that because occasionally I got what I did got today in the morning, which was the speakers before me said I'll probably half of the things I was already planning on saying. So I normally adapt to what people go to. And I also have to thank our Norwegian and uh, the colleague from Finland, because for the first time in my life, I've heard that Portugal is also a rich country. Which <laughs> I've, I've heard some jokes about it when we had a colony in Brazil and we were using all that gold, but not in the last 500 years. So, but that's okay. We do not have oil. We do gamble a little bit, but it's not enough to pay for all these NGOs. But that's okay. We'll, I'll go along with the, we are a very rich country also, so thank you for that. So, um, like he said when he presented me, I started working with the Ministry of Health in 2001 when we decided to decriminalize drug usage. And what I'm going to talk to you about is what we actually, how we got there and what we actually do and what we actually mean by decriminalizing drug usage. So first of all, just as a definition, I'm fairly sure almost all of you by now know this because they told that before in the morning. Decriminalizing, it's not the same thing as legalizing. Decriminalizing basically only means that we do not apply criminal sanctions. It's still illegal. People are not allowed to have in their possession any amount of substance. Uh, there's no open stores where you can just enter and, uh, and buy these sort of substances. Um, the black market is still in place. The only difference is that we do not criminalize people that are in the possession for usage. Meaning, we have a threshold chart that quantifies for all the illicit substances what's considered for 10 days usage. It's debatable. If any of you is typing any questions into the app about the threshold chart, please don't. Invite me for dinner and we can talk about it for two hours and not get into any conclusion in the end of it, but nevertheless, we'll have a nice dinner. So um, we have a threshold chart that quantifies all the, the substances, what's considered for personal usage. If the person has below that, it's considered an administrative offense. Um, well, you might get the impression after 10 minutes of me talking that I wonder a little bit about the, these uh, things. Don't hope you are able to follow me. We heard before in the morning that some countries uh, already decriminalized, some do not enforce. He had a very good slide of that where basically all of the world was pink and pink was the ones that didn't enforce the criminalization of cannabis. Uh, this was more or less what was happening in Portugal. We decided to decriminalize in order to allow our police officers to actually enforce something. Because like everywhere else in the world, people were not actually getting to court because they were caught smoking a joint on the street. Probably the substance would go away, the police would eventually try to get some information about the dealer, but there wouldn't be any paperwork involved because Basically, the paperwork would cost more than the joint. And he, the, the Norwegian colleague had a nice slide of the 1,000 euro fine for uh, 1.2 grams of cannabis. Well, 1.2 grams of cannabis in Portugal costs like 3 euros. So paying a fine of 1,000 euros for a 3 euro commodity, it's not very uh, common sense based, I would say. So what we had to... Um, what we did in Portugal in 2001 when we go for the decriminalization was basically we made it legally. Nowadays, having in your possession any sort of illicit substance, it's exactly the same thing as driving without the seatbelt or being caught talking on the mobile phone while driving. It's still illegal. People are not allowed to do that. But nevertheless, it's not considered a criminal offense, so people are not diverted to a court of law. They do not need to uh, get a lawyer. They will not go to see a judge. They would not get a criminal record out of that. It's still illegal. If the police comes across one of those situations, they will eventually pay a fine or something like that. Our legal framework allows for these administrative offenses to be decided by someone uh, else than a judge. For example, if I'm caught driving without a seatbelt in Portugal, 
the police officer will issue me a financial fine. If I want to appeal from the financial fine, I have that power. I can, for example, ask for it to be converted in community service. And then I will have to talk to a lawyer, and the lawyer will eventually require that for me, and that will be granted for me because the, the state doesn't mind me doing some sort of community service in, in favor of the state. So the possession for usage is basically treated like that legally in Portugal. The original thing about the Portuguese model and I have to, I have to uh, make a little wonder about it. Um, uh, Carl was concerned that I was worried when, by the end, when they were having the questions and answered, he said that Portugal was still an experiment. And, um, well, we, we, we passed that phase. We are now considered a model. I never liked any of those definitions. For 10 years, we changed the law in 2001. For 10 years, we were called the Portuguese experiment, and at some point, we started being called the Portuguese model. We had statistical data that proved that the experiment went out okay, so we started being a model. I don't, think, I, I don't agree with any of those. I have to live with them because people have to make definitions of things to explain them, but it's, it's not a model you will not be able to model what we do in Portugal, in Finland, and you will not be able to model what we do in Portugal, in Norway. So, um, I'm very curious for the, the political debate afterwards. Because I might say something during this hour that they gave me, hope they don't regret it, that might offend some of the politicians later, which is also good because it will eventually rock the boat a little bit and they will debate things harsher. So, um, Portugal, it shouldn't be considered a model. The only thing that all the countries can model after us, it's the way we did it. And the way we did it was, we had a huge problem of heroin usage in the 80s. We had the, the democratic revolution in 74. Before that, Portugal was basically a right-wing dictatorship, very closed in on itself. People were not educated, people were not stimulated or allowed to go abroad, people were not stimulated or allowed to come in. So, because Portugal is not a producer of illicit substance by, uh, by tradition, we didn't have a lot of illicit substances in Portugal. We had a little bit of cannabis from the colonies, we had a little bit of ashes because it was really close to Morocco, but hardly, apart from that, we, we had a lot of alcohol. We are really good at producing and drinking alcohol. But that was never really a problem because it was a, a cultural thing. So <clears throat> after, the, after the, the democratic revolution, there was a very quick opening. People were eager to find new things, to experience new things, to know new things. Europeans were eager to come in and to experience this new country that was just starting. So we started using a lot of cannabis from people that came from the African colonies. A lot of ashish coming in through Euro to Europe started coming through Portugal instead of through, through Spain. Uh, a lot of cocaine from South America, a lot of heroin from South American and Middle East and Eastern countries. So by the 80s, we had an heroin usage problem. By the late 80s, we had a huge heroin usage problem of injecting using. A lot of HIV deaths, a lot of overdose deaths, a lot of tuberculosis, a lot of hepatitis because of the lemon juice that they used to dissolve the, the heroin. So we had a full epidemic of heroin usage. And by full epidemic, I mean that was completely across the Portuguese society. We had rich people, we had poor people, we had middle class people, we had sons of politicians dying of overdose deaths, we had famous people dying of overdose deaths, we had poor people that nobody actually really cared dying of overdose deaths, but nevertheless dying. And so at some point the government decided, okay, we have a problem here. This is the, in every social polls in Portugal, it was considered the main concern of the Portuguese population was drug usage. Statistically, if we compare um, the statistics from Portugal at that time with the rest of Europe, it wasn't that bad. But the perception that the society had was really bad because the heroin usage, especially injected one, is very visible. You get all the teeth problem, you get very skinny, you get very dark thin skin skin tone, uh, there's a lot of petty criminality associated with it. So at some point, everybody knew someone that developed an addiction to heroin. Everybody knew someone personally 
that had died of an overdose death. I just mentioned that at the lunch earlier. I had two kindergarten friends that died of an overdose death when they were 18 or 19 in the beginning of the 90s, and so that was what kick-started the process for the government to decide to change our drug policy. I've heard today that the formal legal drug policy in Finland is from 86. Well. Get a new one. It's it's time. <laughs> it's a, if if any of you is typing, what advice uh, do you give to Finland? That's the one I give for free. All the other one includes the dinner afterwards. So um, and well, if we're going for advice, also some drinks. And um, and so the government decided, okay, we need to change. We need to get a proper drug policy in in place. We didn't have any before. We had uh, some few measures. That were being made, but all very isolated treatment, harm reduction, prevention. It was all across the board and very isolated. It was not a, a comprehensive, a proper drug policy. So, the government decided, okay, we need to change these. We'll sh we should get a group of so-called experts. That everybody agreed on that one. That they were the experts, and asked them to make recommendations about what we should do with our drug policy. And that was in the late 90s. And they did well. They did basically what the, the Norwegian also did. They visit a lot of countries. They um, look at some statistics. They made a lot of public debates like this all across the country. Uh, and by after two years or so. And this is one of the tricky parts about the politicians: is the the acting one, is the not giving the excuse of oh we need more studies, oh we need to see we need to see more, or we need to experiment, or we, no you don't, you can it's not going to be the end of the world, unless you start handing out cocaine or heroin at kindergartens, it's not going to be the end of the world. So at some point the government said okay you have two years. And we need to you to make these recommendations to us, and that's what that group made. That group made around of 83 or 85 different recommendations. And this is another tricky part for politicians: was that at some point the debate in the parliament ended up with the prime minister at the time saying, "Well, you know what? I agree with all that, but I'm not saying this. It was the experts that did it, so we're going to do everything." And so the debate basically went on about the injection rooms, and that was also a very smart political move. move. The, the prime minister said, "Okay, you win. We're not going to do the injection rooms. We are going to do all the other 84 measures." And everybody was happy. Everybody thought, "Oh, we won this debate, so they are not going to get the injection." And which was basically the only one on the news was the injection rooms. Nobody talked about the, the criminalization. Well, they talked a little bit. But not very accurately. People were saying things like, um, "Oh, if we decriminalize, it's going to be a free-for-all market thing, and we will have people flocking down from Europe to use drugs in Portugal." And of course, they don't. It's not legal. It's not easier to buy. We'll have the same amount of trouble buying drugs in Portugal than you do in Finland. So, what's the point of going to Portugal if not for the weather and the nice food, right? So, the drug—it's basically the same. Um, and so, the debate, the political debate, was fairly fast. The implementation of the measures was also fairly fast. Normally, people ask me about the decriminalization and the effects, and I, I, I'm, and against myself, I speak saying this. I think decriminalization is clearly overrated. Decriminalization is a tool that allows all these other measures to make more sense and to be more effective. But it will not solve any problem apart from the criminal record. Again, decriminalizing means that we do not apply criminal sanctions, so we do not give a criminal record. Of course, this will have a direct effect also in stigma. Stigma comes from the Greek word stigma. It's a Greek word that means brand. It was what they gave to criminals back then. Was they branded them with? All hot irons, or they cut some part of their toes, or something like that, just so, so people would notice that stigma, right? Because we we are a little bit more 
civilized now. We develop the criminal record, which is basically a stigma. It's a paper that says, "Well, this guy committed this crime, right?" And so, if you want to apply for a job, if you want to apply for a, a loan for a house, they can check your stigma. They can see, "Oh, this guy has a criminal record. We'll probably not be able to access this." So, decriminalizing has a direct effect on the criminal record and therefore on the stigma, but that's it. It does not have any effect in terms of using, in terms of accessibility. For example, we do not see more people talking on the mobile phone while driving, because it's not considered a criminal offense, right? We do not see people taking off their seat belts, saying, "Oh, it's not a crime, so who cares? I'll drive without the seat belt," right? If we don't see that in Portugal, also, we don't see people saying, "Oh, I'll just smoke that joint because it's just an administrative offense." And the other way around also doesn't work. We don't see people saying, "Oh, I will not use that drug because it's a criminal offense." People try drugs regardless. People try drugs because they're curious, because they want to know how it is, because they want to fall asleep, because they want to stay awake, because they want to get high, because they want to get low, because that's what basically human beings do, right? Since the uh, we've heard, I've saw some. Slides, some Finnish slides in the morning, which were not very educative because I couldn't read them. But nevertheless, I found some pieces there, like a drug-free society. We can do it. No, we can't. We never could. There never, there's never been a drug-free society, right? That's why Vikings invented mead, right? To get really good to go and fight, and that's why they eat mushrooms and、um, roots and things like that. Right, and that's why they smoke strange herbs and things like that. That's what that's what we do now. It's basically the same thing, but for different purposes. So people will continue to use drugs regardless of the legal framework. The legal framework, framework, what it will allow, is what are we going to do afterwards? And so, and this is one of the reasons. Coming back to the idea where I diverted a little bit. Um, this is one of the reasons why I think we shouldn't call the Portuguese drug policy a model. It's because it's pro- probably not copyable anywhere in the world. For example, for me, decriminalizing por-、uh, the, the possession of illicit substances in Portugal, it's basically a diversion scheme. Everybody by now has already a lot of diversion schemes on the street that allows the police officer, instead of sending someone to a court, sending him to a social worker to make some sort of assessment and eventually provide some sort of options. That's what we do. But our diversion scheme—it's probably one of the best in the world because it's in the law. It's the law that diverts the person from a court to these dissuasion commissions. This dissuasion commissions—it's a very fancy name, but it's basically it's what we do. We try we try to, to dissuade people from using drugs. And there's a colleague of mine standing there. He speaks Finnish. If you have any questions, you can ask Daniel in the end and leave me to my tourist part of the trip. Um, what basically what we do at the Dissuasion Commission? The Dissuasion Commission is basically the same. It's an administrative authority empowered to apply sanctions. We receive the residents of the district. Portugal is divided in 18 districts. We have 18 Dissuasion Commissions. Every Dissuasion Commission is responsible to work with the people that live in that district. So it doesn't really matter if you're caught down south because you're on vacation, or if you're up north in the summer festival. What it matters is where you live. You are, when you're caught by a police officer, they normally they have a precision scale in, with them. At least if they are driving a car, they will have a precision scale. If not, they can just hop into a pharmacy and. Weigh the amount of substance that the person has, and if that substance it's below what the threshold quantifies for 10 days usage, it's considered an administrative offence, and you are immediately notified to be present at the dissuasion commission. The notification it's exactly the same as the court one. For example, for hashish the limit is five grams.、Uh, street value mark you market of.、Um, Five grams of ashes in Portugal is around 10 euros. So if you're caught with 5.5 grams of ashes, you get exactly the same paper from the police, but the address saying where you have to show up, it's a court. If you have less, 4.5 grams, for example, it's an administrative offence. You have to go to the dissuasion commission. Okay. So the 
the law it's fairly simple and it's available online if you try to look for it. It's fairly simple and easy to read. I'm a sociologist and I managed to read it all the way through, which is a good, uh, a good indicator of how simple it is. And, um, and um, the sanctions are also very simple. What they say that we must do is we have basically, and that's actually Danielle's job at the Sweden Commission right now, is to make an assessment. And that's the difference, and that's why you are having here a speaker from Portugal and not from all those other countries that you well pointed out that decriminalize drug usage, like Italy, Argentina, Chile, Czech Republic. Because you, you can actually do two sorts of decriminalization of substances. You can do the simple one, which is basically what we do with the driving offenses. If I'm caught driving without the seatbelt, I will pay exactly the same fine as he if he does it every day and I do it once a year. The system treats you exactly in the same way if you did it just once because you forgot to put your seatbelt or if you're a complete maniac and you have some suicidal wishes and you want to drive without a seatbelt to see if you get killed eventually. So the, the law treats you exactly in the same way. And that's the originality of the Portuguese system because our legal framework allowed us to downgrade the possession of an illicit substance from a criminal offense to an administrative offense, it also allows us to create this administrative structure anywhere, in our case, under the Ministry of Health, um, to decide upon those cases. So, I'm not sure if you can do this in Finland, for example. For example, I know you can't do this in England, the legal framework, the British uh, legal framework, does not have the figure of the administrative offense. It's either considered a crime or it's legal. So I have a really hard time explaining the concept of decriminalization to, a, to someone from the Great Britain because they do not have that legal figure of the administrative offense. They do have criminal offenses that do not imply criminal sanctions. For example, for cannabis, they have a thing that they call the cannabis warning. If you're caught by a police officer on the street with a small amount of cannabis, he will give you out a small paper very similar to a fine, but it's not a fine. It's just a paper that says cannabis warning. And it basically says that if you're caught a second time, you will be taken to a police station, you will talk to a social worker at the police station, the social worker will then make a recommendation for a judge to sign, and that recommendation is basically that you will have to pay a fine or do some community service or regular presentations, exactly like ours. In the end, it's exactly like ours, but it's still called a crime because they do not have that figure, that legal figure of the administrative offense. This backing up, this is one of the reasons why, for example, I will never have someone from England saying, oh, we are going to follow your model, because they can't. They, they just can't. They would have to change all their legal framework to be able to do something similar or with the same names that we do in Portugal. So, now, getting to the good part. How long do I have? I'm not good at keeping track of time. 15? <gasps> okay, so for the good part. Okay, the original part about the Portuguese system is that because we were able to create these administrative authorities, we decided to create them under the Ministry of Health. So there's the, they, they actually copied the law that constitutes the, um, the dissuasion commissions was, were copied in a way, from another administrative authority that we have also in the Ministry of Health, which is the one that is responsible for licensing restaurants and bars. They have inspectors that go in a restaurant, they see if they, they follow all the requisition of the law with the fume extractions, with refrigerators and so on, and they pass you a license or they can apply you a fine or they can remove you the license to have a door open and sell food, food to public. It's not a criminal offense, but nevertheless it has some sanctions. So they copied that model from the, the ASAI system, which is the, the, um, well, it's the administrative authority that deals with the food and beverages and things like that. And because it was a particular thing and because the goal was to treat drug using or drug users uh, as an healthcare issue, it's, uh, um, I've, I've been fortunate enough to do these sort of things, conferences, for 
quite some time. I'm, I'm getting old, that's what it is. I was thinking earlier when, when he said that, oh, in 98 we did something, and then they did something in 2000, and I was like, oh man, I'm doing this since 2000, it's too long now. And I, I keep hearing this conversation, oh, we should deal with it as an healthcare issue. We should deal with it as an healthcare issue, but then what happens is that you have elections, and it's very hard for a politician to assume that while campaigning. Because the problem with drug users is that 90% of drug users do not have any problem with drug using. The only problem that 90% of people that use illicit substances, and it's the UN that gives these figures, it's not me, uh, basically their only problem is that the substance that they are using is illegal. You know, apart from that, they do not have any sort of problematic relation with that substance. And then you have 10% of problematic drug users, which normally means drug addicts, which normally means that they probably won't have money to buy for their daily fix every day, which probably means that they will start doing some sort of criminal activities, which normally means that the politician, when confronted with having the option of changing a drug policy, will think about the next elections, and he will also think that the people at home, the voters, when confronted with the words drug users, will think about those 10% of problematic drug users and not the other 90%. And so it's much more easier for a politician to assume the, oh, we need to be tough on drugs and we need to incarcerate them and we need to remove them from society, uh, than having a more humane approach about it. And that's why, normally, that's their, their, that's their speech while campaigning, but then when they get in office, they get confronted with, well, you know what, but your kid was caught smoking a joint at the summer festival. And he goes, oh, that's the law that we decided that we should increase the penalties for. It also applies to that one. And that's why they come up with these diversion schemes and with these... Uh, not to, I, I like that. I, I almost asked you to if I could use that slide, the one that we said that it, you, the, basically they don't apply the law for cannabis users, and basically the whole world was like that, which is like. And so now people are talking about regulating cannabis. Well, of course, <laughs> if they are not applying the law that says it should be a criminal offense, why not regulating it, right? Because normally one of the um, no, I'll leave that one for the politicians later, that's okay. So, backing up, being part of the Ministry of Health, what it does is that my concern when I, when I see some, when someone is caught by a police officer and he gets sent to the Dissuasion Commission, because that's the way it works, I, I cannot go out on the street like, uh, and picking up drug users and bringing them to the Dissuasion Commission to help them. The procedure starts with a police report. The, police start, the, the procedure starts with someone being caught on the street in the possession of an illicit substance for personal usage. And so my focus on the, on the Dissuasion Commission, it's, and it, this is the original part about the Portuguese system, it's the assessment. We have to determine if the person should be considered a recreational user or a drug addict. Because it's not easy, because there's a huge grey area in between of so-called problematic cases, we use some tools for accessing, actually it's called ASSIST, which is basically a test, um, 10, 15 questions, where it will, the result in the end, it will be a, a numeric figure that will allow us to quantify the risk level. And so we are able, after a 35, 45 minute talk with a drug user, we will be able to quantify the risk level of that person based on the answer that they give, of course, and, and also we also cross it with some open questions just for, for well, because it's what, what people under working in health institutions do. Um, and so in the end, we will quantify if it's a low risk, a medium risk, or a high risk situation. And we will then apply the law according to that assessment. For example, a low risk basically means that it's a recreational user. What we do first time offense is we suspend the procedure. It works out as a warning or as a, as a yellow card. Uh, the person comes in, we inform them about the risk, consequences, we inform them about the law and off they go. We keep a record of the person, if the person is caught a second time, then they will have a sanction applied to them. The sanctions, like I mentioned before, exactly the same as the drinking and driving offenses or the driving without a seatbelt. Financial fine, community service, regular presentations, 
Uh, if the person is receiving any benefit from the state, we can revoke the management of that benefit. If the person's profession implies the danger of a third person's life, we can revoke the specific permit to execute that profession, and so on. Um, normally, it's the first three that we apply. Financial fine, community service, or regular presentations. And why is that? Because the regular presentations, which is a social control measure normally used in police stations, the person has to check in to a police station regularly just to check in. We can do that every, anywhere we, we want. We can do that at an healthcare center, we can do that at an employment center, we can do that at a formation center, we can do that at the, at the dissuasion commission itself. If we find there's room for some other motivational work or some follow up meetings, um, and so those are main, mainly the three sanctions we apply. If uh, people also ask me, um, so but what's the purpose of the dissuasion commission? Is it to make people stop using drugs altogether? And no, it isn't. That's not an achievable goal, so we're not going for it. People will use drugs regardless. What we try to do is not to prevent people from using drugs, because that's basically that was the reason why they were sent to us. That was the reason why they were caught and they were notified to be present at the Dissuasion Commission, was because they were already using drugs in the first place. So what we tried to do with that assessment, and eventually some sort of referral or some sort of uh, uh, recommendation for follow-up treatment or counseling, is to prevent that person from misusing or abusing drugs. For example, if you go, and this is, this is where the, the, the mindset shifts from the punishing of a court to a treatment or counseling or recommendation of a medical doctor. For example, if you go to a medical doctor and he takes your blood pressure and he, he, he measures you and he weighs you and you're a little bit over the limit of your weight and your blood pressure is a little bit high, you will probably say, okay, you should eat more salads, you should climb more stairs, you should do regular exercise, you should avoid drink alcohol, and you shouldn't go to the McDonald's every day. And, he, we, and you will probably say, okay, I can live with that, but you know what? I really like alcohol, and I really like McDonald's, so I'll probably go to McDonald's on the weekends. And the medical doctor can live with that, right? He will probably just say, okay, be careful, avoid the fries, and don't go for the ice cream in the end. Go for the apple thing that has a lot of sugar, but not as much as the ice. So, it's, again, it, what, what a medical doctor does, that it's totally different from a court system and a judge, and it's what we do at the Dissuasion Commission, is we look for the symptoms, and we provide options for a cure. But then what a medical doctor does when he can't find the cure, is options for treatment. And the court doesn't do this. The court does. He analyzes what you did wrong, and he comes up with a punishment. And supposedly, that punishment will be so well applied to you, and so enlightenedly decided by a judge sitting higher up than everybody in a fancy clothes and in a hammer and so on, that you will never do it again. And that's one of the reasons why judges and courts hate drug users. Because when they see someone coming in that has a drug-using uh, problem, they automatically know, oh, this guy is going to come back. It's like I can apply the best sanction to him, I can provide all the options, he will probably come back in two months or in three months. So they know it's not going to work. For example, um, I'm sorry I'm using you way too much, but it's because you're just sitting here. If we, if we decide to go out there and rob a bank, and we are both caught because we're not good at it. Uh, and we, 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 we went in really fast, but we stumbled over the big bags of money, and so we were caught by the police. I'm fairly sure we would be taken to a court Monday morning. They were not going to open a court for us on Sunday, right? So on Monday morning, we go to a court. He checks in and he says to the judge, well, you know what, I robbed that bank because I want to buy a new Ferrari and he will go to jail because of that, because he was a very naughty boy, and so he goes to a jail cell to think about it, and it eventually it will work. Eventually he will think about, oh, this is not worthy, I will never rob a bank again, and I might as well uh, forget the Ferrari that I'm not getting. 
And if I check into the judge and I said, well, you know what? I robbed that bank because I like it. I will not go to jail. They will call a psychiatrist. They will evaluate me. They will call me a kleptomaniac and they will lock me up in a mental institution where they will eventually give me enough pills for me to forget altogether about banks or they will eventually try to convince me that it's not really good to rob banks. But do you see the difference? And this is what happens with drug users. Drug users check into a court and they either say to the judge, I use these drugs because I like it, or I use these drugs because I'm addicted to it. And you can almost see the judge, oh no, I, I don't have a solution for any of these. I can lock this guy up and I will remove his problem from the society, but I will not solve his problem. He will, be, he will probably have a harder time finding the substance while he's in jail. But when he comes out, he will have the same problem. Right? And so this is the difference between a, a medical perspective and a criminal perspective. And what we did in Portugal basically was that, was okay, let's deal with it as an healthcare issue. And therefore we know some people we will not be able to cure. Well, some people do not need a cure. Some people do not even need a treatment. Some just need some sort of counseling or not even that. Right? For example, Summer festivals, it's, I have three, we are three members of the Dissuasion Commission of Lisboa and we have to make the hearings and make the decisions. Everybody fights for having vacations in August. And that's because in the late July it starts the summer festival seasons. So by the mid of August we have like 100 people notified to show up on a Monday morning. Because the festival started on Friday afternoon, they are starting to get caught in the summer festival because they have dogs and so on, and they are checking for drug dealers, so eventually they will find also some users. And most of them do not have any problem. I get guys my age checking in saying, well, you know what, I was, I had the, it was in the middle of my vacation, I, I arranged with some colleagues from university to go and see a summer festival, and one of them said, oh, why don't we smoke a joint like we did when we were 20? And well, it's a summer festival, so why not? Right? And so then they get caught, they show up, and what can I do for that guy? Right? Not much. I can just inform him, okay, if you're caught again next year, next summer festival, be careful not to get caught, because otherwise you'll pay a fine. Just simple as that. I can do that. You don't see judges doing that in the court, right? Because when you go to a court, it's like a last resource. And so you better come up with a solution in court. And that's why everybody more or less comes up with these diversion schemes to avoid sending drug users to court. Because they know they are not going to benefit in any way from the court and the judicial system. So decriminalizing, basically, it's just that. It's a diversion scheme. Why we were called the Portuguese model, which I don't like, I might remember you, that is because we also did all the other 84 measures. We increased the accessibility to treatment, we widespread the methadone program because, again, our, our main problem was heroin usage. We came up with a very low threshold control methadone program. We call it maintenance program, and so we did not come up with any excuse to kick people out of the program. For example, most of the drug addicts I see now at the Dissuasion Commission are people that are already at the methadone program. So they take their methadone at 9 o'clock, they are able to maintain their normal social uh, functions in tune, they are able to go and put their kids to school, they are able to have a steady job because they do not need to run around all day getting money for their daily fix, but eventually, well, it's weekend and there's a football match, so why not smoke a joint with our friends? Or why not use some heroin just for good old time's sakes? I know I'm going to go back to, to the methadone program on Monday, so that's okay. And what it happens then is that, for example, they do not inject. If they go, if they want to use heroin recreationally, because they are in the methadone program, but they still want to get high, and methadone will not get you high, um, what they do is they will smoke, right? Because drug, drug users or drug addicts or both are not stupid just because they are using drugs. So they know it's much healthier for them to smoke heroin than to inject heroin. For example, people also ask me, so, but don't you have a fentanyl problem like we do in the United States? Or I was in Australia 
last November, and they asked me, "Oh, but don't you have a problem with ice and amphetamines?" I said, "No. Um, why don't Why don't you? Well, how did you manage to solve that?" And well, we didn't. We never had one because we have cocaine. There's cocaine in the market. It's not that expensive. So if you ask a cocaine user if they rather use cocaine or crack, they will choose cocaine. If you ask a, a, a cocaine user if they rather use crack or ice, they will choose crack. What happens in Australia is that they don't have cocaine or crack, or the one they have is so expensive they are, they are not able to use it. So low-income people use ice because it's cookable. Anywhere, and high-income people use cocaine because it's really expensive in Australia. Because well, they are an island; they do not produce cocaine, so it's not easy to get cocaine into Australia, right? And so, and that's why we were we were talking earlier about regulating, uh, legalizing. This is eventually what it it will come up to. For example, tomorrow you'll hear a story of Anne Marie, really strong one, really good one, um, about ecstasy. Ecstasy is a problem nowadays. Everybody is talking nowadays about pill testing in festivals, and people still come up with the idea of, oh no, maybe we shouldn't. Maybe. Really? Just go ask the kids. Will you use that pill if it's tested or not? They will. So why not test it? The question should be more: Why not? Right? If they are going to use it anyway, because the problem with pills is that it's just a white powder, powder compressed. I can have two exactly alike pills. And one is 100 times stronger than the other, and you will not know it only after the the effects take place. For example, with ashes, you can burn it a little bit, you can smell it, you can touch it to see if it's oily or not. With cocaine, you can taste it. With heroin, the same thing. With weed, you can smell it. With pills, you can't. It's just a white powder that you don't know exactly what's in it. So, please test it. Right? Because kids will use it anyway. But for these sort of things to happen, thank you. For these things to happen, you need to have a comprehensive approach. You need to, for example, if it's considered a criminal offence, I understand that the police officers will have a hard time accepting that at that summer festival there's someone testing uh, illicit substances there that are considered a criminal offence. If it's an administrative offence, well, not that much. Right? For example, we don't see people. I, I use this example. I'm always afraid of this one, because the, in Canada that's what they do. Oh, but that's what we do here. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, really? Don't you have anything else to do? It's like you, you don't see police officers standing on the corner, watching for people driving by without a seatbelt, right? You don't. In Canada, someone says, Oh, but that's what we see. They do that a lot. They hide their cars and take pictures. And I say, oh, Really? For the seatbelt? Apparently, that's what they do in Canada. So, but well, in Portugal, we don't do that, right? If you're driving your car, you're talking on the mobile phone, and by chance you stop at a red light, and a police officer on a motorbike stops right next to you, and he looks at you, and you're talking on the mobile phone. Okay, you're getting pulled over, and you'll get a fine. Okay, or the same thing with the seatbelt. Or if you have a car accident and the police officer is up and you say, "Well, you know what? I was distracted talking on the mobile phone." Well, okay, you're getting a fine. It's the same thing in Portugal. What happens after you decriminalize drug usage? And by the way, decriminalizing it's doable anywhere in the world. You will have politicians sitting over here next to, me, uh, and I'm fairly sure some of them will say, "Oh, this is all really good, but we can't do that." Well, we we had. Sort of a politician earlier saying that to the Norwegian colleague, say, "Oh, we don't have the money to do that." Oh, really? You don't need to. We are way more poor than you are. We always were, and we will probably always be way more than Norwegian. If you consider yourself poor compared to Norwegian, imagine us, right? We're the poorest of the poorest in Europe, always been. So, why? What did you do? We were realistic about it. Okay, we don't have money to pay for. One year in the countryside, in the very nice treatment center. Okay, give them methadone. Just simple as that. We got the Ministry of Agriculture producing puppies. We got the army labs producing methadone. We hand out methadone to our heroin addicts. It's not that expensive. The resource argument—it's a good political excuse. 
because people are always concerned with budgets and with money and with benefits and things like that. But for example, very rarely you see politicians using the argument that it's in, in any therapeutical option, it's always cheaper than incarcerating someone. And that's just as simple as that. We, when, we, when we changed the law, our politicians were like, oh, really? Is that true? Is it cheaper to give them treatment than to put them in jail? So, oh, let's do that, please. And, and it is true. And the, the, it's not only true, but the, the, the other thing is that if you provide treatment options, you actually have a chance. Okay? People might relapse. People might relapse after two days, after two months, after two years. There's a chance of relapsing. But with incarceration, there's no chance for treatment. There is no chance for cure, for example. Like I said before, and this is really important because of the, the, the mindset of the... And just to finish, I, I want to use this example because of the, the Just Say No campaign worked really well in Scandinavian countries. I was, uh, I was always amazed by it, and at some point I, I, I thought a little bit about it, and I, what I think it is, it's because things normally work in Scandinavia. The trash bus arrives on time. The metro always runs on time. If you go and get the benefit, it will be paid on that day. There is not going to be delays. If you have a medical consultation, it will be on that day. Well, in Latin countries, it's not exactly like that. Things happen, and occasionally people are not in their workplace, and so we are more or less used to improvise. So I, was, I think that the Just Say No campaign worked for you because of that because you, you trusted the state. Well, we didn't. We had a, a right-wing dictatorship for too long, and then we had a, a, a sort of a left-wing, free-for-all thing for not that long, actually, but that's okay. And so we, we are used of not trusting the state. So when the state tells us, oh, don't do that, we don't believe it. But then I have... A, okay, I have... A, um, the, but that's what normal um, human being... Uh, does. Normally, human beings don't trust that no thing, right? For example, I have uh, three kids. One is five and a half, uh, the other one is almost 12, and I have one with 15. That's a problem, I'm one. That's okay. And I also have a grandmother that is 98. And to all four of them, when I tell them, oh, don't do that, you can see their eyes glinting and think, oh, turn around and I'll try it anyway. And that's what kids do with drugs. And for example, if you, if you put the, all the drugs at the same box, it's don't do that. Because the first one they will try is cannabis. And if, even if something goes really, really wrong the first time you try cannabis, you will just feel sick and you fall asleep. That's it. It's not, well, if you're not driving or uh, riding an airplane or anything, it's, it's not going to be that hard. Okay? If, if something goes really, really wrong, if something goes really, really well, you'll, you'll get cramps on your cheeks because you laugh so much. Right? So in the end, you'll go like, oh, really? Just say no, why? And so if they lie to that one, they probably lie to all the other ones. Let's try it. This one was not the one that they were being serious about the just say no. Let's try on and on and on. So this is, this is just an example, just to finish off the... Uh, the um, the amount of political will it takes to actually change a drug policy properly. We don't use the Just Say No campaigns anymore. Just Say No campaigns are very good for voters. Uh, old ladies at home love watching soap opera actors showing up on television and saying, oh, Just Say No to drugs. They think, oh, they are doing something. They are actually working for our kids to avoid using drugs. Well, they don't work. All the research around the world show that the Just Say No campaigns does not have any sort of effect in the actual usage figures. So one of the recommendations that the group of experts made was, OK, let's stop doing this Just Say No campaign. And let's, instead of using all this amount of money, because famous people get paid well, Let's use it to do some smaller but targeted campaigns for specific groups of the demographics. For example, now in Portugal, sorry, now in Portugal we have specific campaigns for Ukrainian immigrants in Russian. We have specific campaigns in Creole for African immigrants. We have specific campaigns for university students. 
We have specific campaigns for sex workers. So I'm, I'm not aware of any of those campaigns. I'm not a university student, I'm not a sex worker, I'm not a, a Ukrainian immigrant. So I'm aware of them because there's leaflets around the office about them, but they are not specifically targeted for me. So they are not getting any votes out of those campaigns because most of those demographics are not very good at voting. But nevertheless, they are getting an effect in terms of the usage figures, and this shows the amount of political will it actually takes to do these sort of things, because at some point what happens is that, and you probably noticed that by now, um, you, you can have all these venues and you can have all these very educated people about the drug issues and the drug problems, but the problem is that in the end it will all be decided at the political level. It will all be decided by three or four people locked in an office, most of them male, most of them 50, 60-year-old male in grey suits, that will eventually have to measure next elections, electoral results, drug policy results in 10 years. Uh, that's not really that important, right? And that's what happened in Portugal. In Portugal, we changed the law, like, like, uh, like Carl said before, and... Uh, I'm being honest, I, I don't really, I, I, I was really, in, in the beginning, the first time people said, oh, we are here to see the Portuguese experiment. I thought, oh, what? That's really not a very nice thing to say. If I feel like the little mice running around the maze and people looking at me, oh, talking to the drug users and trying to provide help and things. And at some point, they st we started calling us the Portuguese model. But that point took like 15 years. Politicians do not work in 15-year cycles, right? They work in four- or five-year cycles, so they are not going for the experiments very easily unless they know what the result is going to be and if they know the results are going to be fast. And so that's just to finish. That's also the reason why I don't like being called a model. It's because I still feel like the little mice, but fortunately I managed to get out of the maze, and so they go like, oh, this little one saved himself, let's copy what he's doing. And before someone texts, what's my advice? My advice is don't follow Norway. I have a, there was some uh, public servant, she started being a politician, and at some point she changed for a public servant, which is more or less the same thing, said that what, what Finland was thinking on doing was following Norway. And we just had the Norwegian calling saying, what we are doing is following the Portuguese model. And I'm like, really? What? Don't do that. Just come up with solutions for your own problem. What you have to do is you have to... Is, I'm getting to the answering questions part because eventually someone will ask me that. They asked you that, right? So they will probably also ask me that. It's a... Well, evaluate the problem, evaluate the tools you have and come up with solutions for yourself. You're probably much more knowledgeable about the Finland uh, drug usage situation, the Finland policing situation, the Finland prison system, the Finland educational system, the Finland healthcare system than I am, right? I just arrived yesterday, it's my first time ever in Finland. I've noticed your big and blue eyes, so it's, uh, for me it's like Norway. Don't be offended by that. So there's lots of questions for you. We have okay. uh, time for a few. Uh, if, if, if someone sees me, just ask me the questions outside. I'm, I'm going to be here today and tomorrow, so it's all good. If yeah, because as, as you said, questions. you've had a pretty long experiment, experiment yes. here, like yes. 20 years. Uh, so you kind of know what will happen after decriminalization. So, uh, I know what happened there. First, not, is there, is there like, what, what has happened to the criticism? Is there like lots of... Uh, People are saying that this was not a good idea. No, no, not really. Well, the criticism that were in the beginning was basically, he also touched that a little bit uh, of the, the popular speech and the fear-monging speech around drug policy, which also connects with the 10% of 10 problematic drug users. The criticism we had in the beginning was that it was going to be a free-for-all because it was going to be accessible anywhere and people would be doing it openly on the street. And it, 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 it didn't come true because it's still illegal. Yet it's uh, the... Decriminalizing does not have any sort of effect in terms of supply chain. If you see drug using as a demand and supply uh, situation, 
the criminalizing doesn't affect the supply. Supply is still considered a criminal offense. If I go out in Portugal and try to buy an illicit substance, the drug dealer will be sent to a court of law, I will be sent to the dissuasion commission. So the criminalizing only messes with the demand. So it doesn't have any sort of effect in terms of, and therefore the, the criticism died out because of that, because the criticism was basically centered on, oh, if we decriminalize, our youngsters will do more drugs. And I, I, it doesn't happen. Uh, then, uh, what is the proportion of the problematic users and the recreational users that come to this US and oh, it's the, the, Is it like, uh, uh, how, what percentage are like? It's around 10-15% of drug addicts, 85% uh, recreational users, and of those 85%, I would say around 20 of the recreation of the non-addicts around 20% are considered medium risk and therefore they have some sort of referral or some sort of follow-up meeting. It's the same. The figures are exactly the same as the UN presents globally. 90% of the people that use drugs around the world are not problematic users. And what we see on a daily basis in the Dissuasion Commission is exactly that. Most of the cases we see is recreational users of cannabis. I think many people might be afraid of like decriminalization leading to legalization and leading to all these kind of things. Uh, is there uh, lots of talks about like legalizing cannabis, for example, people are asking? Well, the, 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 the debate we're seeing around the legalizing of cannabis in Portugal, it's exactly the same as we see in all the other countries. It was like some states in the United States regulated, which is different. We have to be careful with these terms because, and politically it's really important because cannabis is not legalized anywhere in the world. Some states in the United States, Uruguay and Canada regulated cannabis, which means that you need to meet some sort of criteria to access that substance. It's the same thing you have with alcohol and which is a different thing of what we have with bread, for example. If I want to send my five-year-old out in the grocery shop to buy bread, he can go, he can buy it, and he can bring it home. If I send him to buy a bottle of wine, they won't sell it, because it's not legal. What the wine is, is regulated. So the talks we're having about in Portugal, about regulating the cannabis market, it's exactly the same that we see all around the world, because, well, Canada did it, and... Canada didn't blow up, right? What was the opinion uh, of the Portuguese police before the reform? Okay. And has it changed? Yes. Because that's like one, one, of, one of the main things. Because po that's a good, good question. In the beginning, what happened, I, it will probably take me a couple of minutes to answer that one. Sorry, I'm in the rhythm, so I'll do it fast. What was happening before 2001 was basically we were one of those where the, the possession was not actually enforced by the police. The police normally targeted drug users to get information about the drug dealers. So they were picking up drug users on the street, they were taking them to the police station, and they were telling them, OK, if you don't give me the name of the drug dealer, I will send your procedure to court. And what they thought was, oh, they are going to decriminalize, so they are going to create this dissuasion commission, but this won't work for us. It will not be threatening enough to say, if you don't give me the name, I will send this to the dissuasion commission. And so they were not comfortable with the change, and also they were not comfortable because normally, at least in Portugal, it was, and it still is a little bit, the police forces, it's a fairly militarized structure, very heavy structure, and therefore not very comfortable with changes. If you try to change every, anything around policing, you will have a hard time because everything is very strict and very done by, by the book, supposedly. What happened now? Because it's not considered a criminal offense, because it's only an administrative offense, it's much more easier for the police officer to assume a more pedagogic approach about the situation, inform about the law, and in the meantime, get information about the dealers. Because what was happening was that, okay, if you don't give me the name, we'll send this to court. 
But if the guy gives the name, you have to write it down to send it to court against the drug dealer, and then the guy has to sign it, and so then the dealer will see in court that they, he was the one that wrote it out on them. So there was a problem there. Now what happens is it's much more easier for the police officer to actually not do the paperwork and get information informally about the dealer. So what happened is that they adapted, and instead of targeting drug users to get to the small-time dealers, They are targeting small-time dealers to get to the medium-sized dealers, and the figures we see that statistically is available on the internet is that now in Portugal we have less seizures of illicit substances being made than they were before, but the amount, the total amount of substances, is higher than it was before, which basically means that they move the step up the ladder of trafficking chain. So they adapted. They weren't happy in the beginning. Bottom line. They weren't happy in the beginning. They adapted to the law, and for them, it's the same. Wonderful. The Thank work. you. Oh, my pleasure. And now we're going to have a little.